Our last speaker uh, will provide us with uh, uh, a few thoughts about how Europe is preparing for the next pandemic. And um, um, the speaker is Jacques Biot, who I suppose is well known to this group, a former director of the Ecole Polytechnique in France. Jacques, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michel, and uh, thank you to uh, Thierry, of course, for this uh, kind invitation. It's, uh, it's both a honor and a privilege to be here with all of you, and I learn a lot from uh, other panels. So uh, just one word to say that I have no conflict of interest on this one in view of my other uh, positions and that views expressed here are uh, my own. Um, as I was aware that I would be the last hurdle before, the, before lunch, I think, uh, I have only four slides after this one. So we'll first look into lessons <clears throat> to learn from how Europe fared with uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then we'll try to look at the ingredients of, of a pandemic management, and then we'll try to assess the key performance indicators of Europe in terms of preparedness, and, and I will try to uh, make a conclusion. So how did Europe fare with COVID-19? Well, I'd say not, not that bad, you know. We are very good at uh, really uh, uh, chasing ourselves uh, in Europe, but, but I mean, this is not legible from the back of the room, but basically the circles show the European countries. This is a graph uh, from uh, the John Hopkins Institute, which uh, followed the statistics of, uh, of COVID. And, and this graph only focuses on the 20 most affected countries. So you see, um, you see that actually Europe is pretty much uh, in the average. The very good ones uh, were uh, mostly Asian countries, uh, South Korea and Japan, uh, and the less good, I would say, uh, uh, guys were mostly, well, Peru, which was clearly an outlier, and, uh, and, and the US in terms of mortality. The graph on the right is, not, is, is the case fatality ratio, which shows that on this respect, many Western European countries were pretty good at limiting the impact. So they had a high mobility, but they were able to uh, limit uh, the, uh, I would say, the impact of the disease, probably because the health systems were, were pretty good. Now, if you go into a more detailed assessment and you look at all countries in Europe, you will see that, I mean, we had some countries, especially in uh, Eastern Europe, which were pretty badly affected and which didn't fare as well as those ones. So my take on that one would be that, well, there, there wasn't really such a thing as Europe because there were pretty, uh, I would say, unequal responses in terms of time and uh, management. Uh, the Europeans, for instance, left our Italian friends for a long while, uh, completely alone with what was happening in Lombardia. Um, the Brits, which at that time were still, uh, I would say, uh, in Europe, uh, made their own, I would say, policy. But still, there is one great success which I think we should recognize, which is the decision by the Commission to procure vaccines as soon as they were ready on a centralized basis in order to avoid competition between countries. And I, I think really that was the, one of the first times where really Europe played a very important role in terms of taking care of, uh, of its citizens in a, in a practical way. Now, what are the ingredients for pandemics management that has been touched upon quite a lot by, by other speakers? What we should remind is that the next pandemics will not necessarily be uh, like, co like COVID, you know? I mean, uh, uh, Antoine showed us that uh, COVID-19 was airborne, but, but if you look at his, the history of epidemics, there were plenty of epidemics which were not airborne, which were contact-borne, water-borne, or, and, and so um, Michel said that the, the next pandemic is a certainty we don't know. We only don't know when, and I would add, we only don't know which bug. And, and the bugs may differ in terms of the uh, way of transmission, uh, with a big question very often, which is at which time does the bug become, I mean, with, at which time does the transmission become interhuman? Uh, if the bug comes from somewhere else. Uh, I would add another division in, in the classification of bugs, which is whether they 
are susceptible or not to uh, humoral immunity and to uh, which is what you use basically for uh, for covid vaccination let's remember that even with uh, rna we, we still don't have a vaccine against aids uh, after 20 like 30 years of research we don't have a vaccine against malaria or we hardly have one, uh, etc. And, and we had issues with the dengue, vac dengue vaccine. So, I mean, mankind was pretty lucky and talented, uh, to quote uh, Woody Allen, but, but uh, in having a vaccine so fast, because, I mean, with other bugs, it, it could become much more, much more difficult. If on the right side, the, the graph is much, pretty much a consultant's graph, uh, which I borrowed from the uh, European CDC, been a consultant for many years, so I'm not, this is not pejorative, but basically I tried to see what do you need in terms of, of practical skills if you want to implement the skill of preparedness and the response and the feedback. And I think if you ask the layman in the, in the street, they would pretty much think that, um, I mean, pandemic management relies mostly on epidemiology, if they know what this means, and, and infectiology, and uh, that this is a health issue. But it's, it's not just a health issue. It's uh, an issue where you will need to test and trace and contain and protect. And, uh, and so you will need people versed with law and order because if you lock people down, you don't do this without having riots or protestations or things like that. You will need, you may need environmental measures. And, and I was happy to hear about the climate impact because I mean, for instance, you may want to reduce uh, a source of pollution which is aggravating the disease, etc. So I'm not going into detail of this, but let's remember it's not just a health issue. It's, uh, it's really a, a political issue which involves almost every part of an administration. Now, where is Europe from this respect? Well, first of all, you need institutions. I mean, uh, I mean, pandemic preparedness cannot rely on uh, on disorder, and and that's where you immediately face some, I would say, questions, uh, because I mean, if you, for those of you who've been read, who've been reading the uh, recent book by uh, Agnès Buzyn, who is a friend and, and the former minister of health, where she explains how she lived the beginning of the epidemics, you see that it was really difficult for her to find who would make the right decision. And, and she was kind of going from one person to another one. And although she was a medic and she had a feeling that something bad was coming. So the coordination between WHO and the EC, ECDC, ECDC and HERA, which is a new agency which uh, Europe created, which is uh, basically for uh, health emergency response and uh, awareness, um, and, and the role of the Commission, and the role of the governance in view of subsidiarity. I mean, nobody really could say how this is going to be coordinated. We in France are very good at creating coordinators, but usually we create so many of them that you need somebody to coordinate the coordinators. And so we, we are still at the stage where, I mean, we will need some uh, agreement between the various parties. Um, as mentioned, it's not just health, it's uh, health, but it also involves uh, foreign ministers if you need to close borders. Uh, you need the home office if you need to lock people down and uh, check that they don't get from, out from their uh, homes. Uh, you need local authorities. And here again, you will need to uh, balance the, uh, the responsibilities. And certainly you need central decision making but also you need local action. And uh, in, in Europe, it often happens that uh, there is kind of a, a divide between both ends of the chain. Uh, in terms of, of uh, epidemiology and public health, I think we, we had a lot of, uh, of, of scientific deglobalization just in the wake of the global, I would say, deglobalization. Uh, and, and I think Scientists really need to speak together. Whatever happens, uh, I mean, uh, whenever kind of fighters and the combatants are fighting each other or, uh, or distrusting each other, but we need scientists to be able to travel and uh, talk and exchange data. And that's certainly something which uh, we must emphasize for the next pandemics. Um, in terms of containment, Europe has a specific issue because we have what is called the Schengen uh, setting 
And so you don't close borders like that. So uh, if, if we have to lock down, uh, this will be a difficult issue. And finally, in terms of finding the cure and the protection, um, I really, um, I think we need to realize that there has been a steep decline in the uh, uh, in life science research. And uh, if you look at the Nobel Prizes and uh, at, at many, many uh, publications, certainly, many of them were not done in, in Europe. We still have very strong uh, research institutions, and I'm not going to quote them all, uh, but uh, in Germany, in the UK, in uh, Italy, in, in France, in Switzerland, I mean, we really have great institutions, but they don't receive the, the amount of uh, public funding that their American or Chinese counterparts, or probably Japanese counterparts re would receive. Um, we clearly have a pharma industry decline, I mean, because of course, containment for decades, and we also face the same issue that was mentioned of, uh, of drug shortages, which I would want to uh, emphasize is mostly due to the fact that, I mean, authorities have not been attentive enough to the fact that within a production chain, which usually uh, includes uh, tens of uh, steps, uh, one step is in the hands of, 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 a, of a lonely, of only one uh, producer. And whether he's Chinese or wherever, I mean, we, we had shortages in Europe, which were due to uh, uh, problems in uh, facilities in, uh, in, in Sweden or in Italy or in France. So it's not, once again, let's not just blame the Chinese for uh, having taken the industry. I think it's more a question of procurement and, uh, and making procurement uh, safer in, uh, in the pharma industry. Plus, the pharma industry has completely I would say outsourced its uh, research, and uh, and that's by the way, good thing because that's how we had the vaccines for 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 COVID, but but I mean the French the sorry the European uh, um, pharma industry is certainly much weaker than what it was uh, 20 years ago, and um, and and then finally we have and this was emphasized by Antoine. I mean, with the Trump example, but we also have a high level of uh, anti-vax sentiment in Europe, and that's something which would make uh, protection difficult. So, my takeaways, um, I think we really must, everybody who is responsible in uh, politics, we must avoid looking for scapegoats. Uh, I think in the beginning of the epidemics, there were many people who tried to blame others and I mean, when, when there is a pandemic, it's not the time to blame others. It's the time to work together. And uh, that's uh, something very important. And, and at the time of X Twitter, now X uh, and, uh, and social networks, it's, it's really difficult to protect those who make decisions. And, and that's a, a big issue, not just in healthcare, but it's an issue here. Um, we really, I mean, need to see how we can prolong the idea of the, uh, of the centralized vaccine procurement scheme, because at, at this stage, it was to some extent one shot, but, but how can we make this happen in the future? Uh, because with another commission, you don't know what, what might happen. Um, we need to really build again medical staff, because all over Europe, we are lacking physicians, and that's a, that's a big issue, not just for pandemics, but it will be an issue for pandemics. Um, we have, based, in general, a profound decay of, uh, of public health uh, systems because of course containment that, that has been going for, for years. Uh, we definitely need more public education. You know, education was raised in several panels during this conference, and I think it has to do with the economy, but I mean, much of the anti-vax sentiment and the resistance to lockdowns, etc., is due to the fact that our populations are, are less and less educated and, and we need to really put a focus on education. And that's my last uh, bullet point, really improve the priority for science. I'm, I'm struck by the distrust for science, uh, which you can find in the, the population, but also among politicians and, uh, and among uh, media and decision makers. And so I think we should all strive to say that humanity will prosper if, you, if we encourage science and uh, rely on science. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Jacques, and thank you for your uh, plea for science. If there's one success uh, to the COVID pandemic, it's really open science. There's been no borders and uh, there's been new systems put in place uh, that really have allowed a wide and rapid communication of scientific innovation.